uh, if you'd like. Um, if, if not, you can use the students sort of hiding out in the background. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Actually, my topic, I'm going to address the topic that was in the, the, the advertisement, which is uh, international law, lawfare, and the challenge of Iran. And it's a, it's a particular pleasure to be doing this as part of this seminar series organized by the Institute for the Study of Global Semitism and Policy. And it's a particular pleasure to be giving this talk, as was alluded to before my mother-in-law, Nina Rockwell, uh, her brother, Charlie Wazanski, uh, uh, their friend, uh, Lenore Martin, and I was just introduced to you know, uh, Ellen Green. Ellen Green. And I'm almost tempted, why don't we actually, sort of, maybe the rest of you can introduce yourselves as well, since this is sort of going to be, I think, a little bit more of a round table than the usual uh, lecture. Yes? Let me start with you, ma'am. Okay. Hi. Blair from Cardoso, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, my name is Cindy Petner. Um, I live right in Cambridge in Central Square and saw the uh, Institute's flyers while I was running through Harvard Yard, and it was really interesting to me. Nice to engage my lawyer brain that was 30 years ago once again. So uh, I went to Benjamin Cardozo back in the day. So. Thank you for coming. Sir? Yes, hi. Uh, Joseph Regna, and I'm a public health physician with the Society for Risk Analysis. Okay, very good. Yourself? I'm a writer of wires that we came with. We have our group in our Charles was very good. Thank you. Come in. Uh, my name is Skip Victor. I'm, I live in Los Angeles. I've been spending a year here uh, at Harvard at the Kennedy School, the Business School. Mostly interested in public finance, but strong interest in Israel and the issues that you'll cover in the seminar today. So we're very happy to be here. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay. I'm Anya Sedler. I'm a PhD student in National Security University. Very good. And we're just going around and introducing ourselves. I need you to get here. Of course, I didn't recognize you. Charlie's wife. <laughs> <laughs> those, those sunglasses. Glamour. <laughs> Glamour. <laughs> Now, 
Lawfare is the strategy of using law as a substitute for traditional military means to uh, achieve or help achieve operational objectives. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Just sort of a highlight, a foreshadow. Okay, the first part. The Iranian regime's anti-Semitism and why it matters. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is, of course, famous for his anti-Semitic rhetoric. For example, he referred to Israel's founding citizens as the filthiest and greatest of criminals, only pure human, said of the Jewish state that the very existence of the Zionist regime is an insult to humankind, said it was a cancerous tumor that consumed excise and urged the annihilation of the Zionist regime. However, Ahmadinejad is far from the only senior official to engage in virulent According to the New York Times, in June of this year, at a UN-sponsored conference marking International Day Against Drug Abuse, Iranian First Vice President Mohammad Rahim bizarrely claimed that the Talmud, a central text of Judaism, is responsible for the spread of illegal drugs around the world. Rahim claimed that Jews controlled the illegal drug trade in order to fulfill what he said is a Talmudic writ, quote, to destroy everyone who opposes the Jews. Now, you've probably all heard it said that Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, is far more important than anyone else in the Iranian political system, including President Ahmadinejad and Vice President Rahimi. It's therefore crucial to note that Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has also frequently used anti-Semitic rhetoric, including referring to the Jewish state as a, quote, cancerous tumor. More interesting, I think, than the specifics of Khamenei's hateful rhetoric is the context in which it is expressed. Karim Sajakur, an Iranian-American, uh, who's one of the U.S.'s leading experts on Iran, uh, wrote in his book on Ayatollah Khamenei that, quote, the Iranian leaders, particularly Khamenei, express an unrelenting and obsessive contempt for the Jewish state. Unrelenting, obsessive contempt for the Jewish state, despite the fact that the Palestinian issue does not resonate strongly on the Iranian street. Iran is not Arab, has no land or border disputes with Israel, and has no Palestinian refugee problem. Sajikor calls it remarkable that Israel, the issue, he says, that is featured most prominently in Khamenei's political discourse over the past two decades, right? Israel is the issue that's featured most prominently in Khamenei's political discourse over the past few decades, is one that, quote, has virtually no impact on the daily lives of Iranians. Sajikor also notes that Khamenei, surprisingly, focuses less on the prospects of Palestinian statehood than on the criminal behavior of wicked Zionists, not just in the Holy Land, but throughout the world. Khamenei's rhetoric is thus much less pro-Palestinian that it is obsessively anti-Jewish and anti-Israel. Why does such Iranian anti-Semitism matter? It matters because, like the dehumanizing rhetoric of Hitler and so many others, it may be a precursor to genocide. It matters because Iran is seeking a nuclear arsenal, a few bombs from which could be sufficient to quickly perpetrate that genocide against the Six million Jews gathered together in time of Israel. Iran's anti-Semitism matters because some influential strategists in Washington and elsewhere argue that the Iranian regime is rational and must deterrent. And therefore, we shouldn't worry so much about it acquiring nuclear weapons. To my mind, the Iranian leadership's anti-Semitic nonsense, obsessively repeated and serving little to no practical purpose is strong proof of the Iranian regime's irrationality and exceptional dangerousness. With that, let's turn from the Iranian regime's rhetoric to its record, <clears throat> its remarkable record of non-compliance in various areas of international law. Before I provide a brief sector-by-sector -sector overview of Iran's record of non-compliance with international law, I thought it might be interesting to provide some context as to why Iran's record of compliance with international law is as it is. Uh, I haven't been able to find a lot of quotes from Iran's supreme leaders addressing international law compliance. But 
But those that do exist are, I think, revealed. <clears throat> As you may know, the Islamic Republic of Iran has had just two supreme leaders, the country's most powerful position, since the Iranian Revolution in 1979. The first was Ayatollah Mukhola Khomeini. And when he died in 1989, he was replaced by Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who had previously served as president of Iran, the country's second most powerful position, from 81 to 89. Khamenei continues as supreme leader through the present day. Both of the quotes I've come uh, across are about international human rights law. Ayatollah Mukhola Khomeini, leader of the Islamic Revolution, and first supreme leader, asserted that, quote, what they call human rights is nothing but a collection of corrupt rules worked out by Zionists to destroy all true religions. What they call human rights is nothing but a collection of corrupt rules worked out by Zionists to destroy all true religions. There we go with the anti-Semitism again. The quote about international law from Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the current Supreme Leader, is as follows. He said, when we want to find out what is right and what is wrong, we do not go to the United Nations. We go to the Holy Quran. For us, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, he said, is nothing but a collection of mumbo jumbo by disciples of Satan. Nothing but a collection of mumbo jumbo by disciples of Satan, he said Al Khamenei, the Quran Supreme Leader. Now, <clears throat> I think Ayatollah Khamenei's juxtaposition here of international law with the Quran is at the heart of the Iranian regime's attitude towards international law. Iran is a theocracy. Power is concentrated in the Supreme Leader and the Council of Guardians, positions that are unelected and religiously oriented. <clears throat> the theory behind this is velayat e meaning rule by the jurisprudent or rule of the Islamic jurist. This concept is not without its opponents, <clears throat> both within Iran and within the Shiite religious establishment broadly. <clears throat> but it is the fundamental ruling ethos of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Ayatollah Khomeini was famously quoted as saying that the will of the people must be second to the will of God. As a reflection of this attitude, Article 4 of the Iranian Constitution asserts that all articles of the Constitution, as well as all other laws, i.e. international laws, must be based upon Islamic criteria. The Iranian leadership has repeatedly expressed its belief that it is carrying out divine will, which has precedence over international law by men and women in working to bring down an international system that serves the interests of the United States, the great Satan. The Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, has explained his antipathy to the United States as follows, and I quote, the source of all human torment and suffering is the liberal democracy promoted I have sites to hold these books in case you want afterwards. So that's what the Supreme Leaders of Iran had to say about international law. What has been their record of compliance with international law? The Islamic Republic of Iran has flouted international diplomatic law since its founding in 1979 by Ayatollah Khomeini. The Islamic Republic's first major flouting of international law was the seizure in November of that year of diplomats at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The seizure and holding the hostages violated fundamental tenet of international law, the inviolability of diplomatic envoys and embassies, <clears throat> uh, violating uh, uh, the inviolability of diplomatic envoys and embassies has in subsequent years become a kind of specialty of the Iranians. Subsequent violations by Iran of these same diplomatic laws, which are set forth in the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, and the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations include Iran's sponsorship of the 1983 Hezbollah bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, killing 63, its sponsorship of the 92 Hezbollah bombing of the Israeli Embassy in Argentina, killing 29, its sponsorship of the 1998 bombings of the U.S. Embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, the 2011 plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador to the United States in Washington, D.C., one of my favorite restaurants in Washington, D.C., restaurant the plot was to uh, occur at, and we were happy to see just recently a guilty plea uh, in that plot by Mr. Siar. Uh, the 2011 ransacking of the British Embassy in Tehran, and various attacks and attempted attacks this year on Israeli diplomats, including in India, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. 
In addition, Iran has often engaged its own diplomats in activities incommensurate with their diplomatic status, including narcotic smuggling and involvement with terrorist activities. Iran also has a record of egregious violations of its international human rights law commitments, including especially those under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Iran has, in recent years, especially since the disputed 2009 new election of Ahmadinejad, violated numerous articles of the Covenant, including prohibitions on torture, the prohibitions on discrimination on the basis of gender and religion, and the rights of freedom of expression, assembly, religion, and association. In the nuclear non-proliferation arena, my specialty, Iran continues to open and admittedly violate UN Security Council resolutions ordering Iran to suspend its nuclear mission, reprocessing and heavy water-related activities. It's also violating its nuclear non-proliferation treaty commitments. Um, I could also uh, go through the sections on Iran's violations of the terrorism law and narcotics law, uh, but I think I'll uh, skip those for now. I'm happy to answer those uh, during Q&A. Uh, I want to turn to what characterizes Iran's violations of international law. Other than the sheer frequency and variety, I think it's interesting to note Iran's extensive use of proxies. For example, in most of the embassy attacks, since the Iranian government has used proxies such as Hezbollah or quote unquote Iranian students. Now, why are they doing this? Why are they using proxies? This could be seen as an Iranian nod to international law. You don't care at all about being seen as violating international law. You violate it yourself. More efficient to just violate it yourself. Get somebody else who may or may not perfectly follow your instructions to do it. However, I think there's a somewhat more sophisticated reason Iran's extensive use of proxies. International law has an exceptionally high threshold for when a forceful response against the state sponsor of a non-state armed group is justified. Very high threshold for going after the principle behind the proxy. <clears throat> the international community's short attention span means that by the time Western governments are able to prove, using publicly available or declassifiable information, that Iran was behind the attack. The pressure to retaliate against Iran, and certainly the support for doing so, has lessened. For example, 1987, four years after the Marine Barracks bombing in Beirut, Iran's then Minister of Revolutionary Guards, Mohsen Rafiqus, admitted that, quote, both the TNT and the ideology which in one blast, this is quoted from him, both the TNT and the ideology which in one blast sent to hell 400 officers, NCOs, and soldiers at the Marine headquarters were provided by flat out admission. Well, was President Reagan going to order a military strike against Iran for an attack four years earlier? He did not. By then, everybody had moved on. Indeed, the Iran-Contra scandal had broken. The last thing the President was going to do was to compound the embarrassment by drawing attention to Rafi Deuce's admission. So the difficulty in expeditiously proving that a particular attack by one of its proxies was ordered by Iran, enables Iran to act through its surrogates with impunity and exploitation of the rules of law. This is, by the way, something that needs to be changed in international law. Now, in light of Iran's record of non-compliance with international law, what can we expect from a nuclear armed Iran? An Iranian nuclear arsenal would serve Iran as a nuclear umbrella making countries victimized by Iranian-sponsored terrorism or other violations of international law even more reluctant to retaliate against Iran. This would likely make Iran an even more self-confident supporter of terrorism and violator of other international laws. In light of Iran's record of flouting international law without a nuclear umbrella, the idea of a nuclear armed Iran is a frightening one. So what can be done? What can be done now about Iran's repeated flouting of international law, particularly in the nuclear arena? <clears throat> For about the first three decades since the 1979 Iran revolution, Iran was hardly ever held accountable for its violations. I wrote a scholarly article about this and found an astonishing record of failure to hold Iran accountable for its violations, particularly, I think, because Iran was so good at using the process. 
this impunity emboldened Iran. Only within the last few years, and really only in the nuclear arena, in which Iran itself admits that it is violating international law, has Iran been made to pay a heavy price for its violations. The economic sanctions on Iran have clearly had a strong impact on the Iranian economy. However, sanctions have so far failed to achieve their intended objective of inducing Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei to agree or halt his nuclear weapons program. Three rounds of failed multilateral talks have demonstrated that the United States and its allies do not yet have sufficient leverage to make Khamenei yield and agree to meet Iran's obligations under international law. As noted by yesterday's Washington Post, the Obama administration has recently dangled an offer of bilateral talks, just the U.S. and Iran, in hopes of, quote, luring Iran back to the negotiating table. But the Iranian leadership is, according to yesterday's uh, article, uh, locked in a fierce internal debate over whether to even agree to sit down bilaterally with the United States. And according to the Post, Iran has shown no hint that it will accept the offer. Instead, said the article, intelligence analysts are detecting signs of continued progress at Iran's uranium enrichment plants and no significant softening on the part of the country's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, who will ultimately decide Iran's nuclear force. So what do we do now? How can the United States acquire sufficient additional leverage over Iran to induce it to comply with international law? It seems to me that one part of the answer is lawfare. The strategy of using law as a substitute for traditional military means to achieve an operational objective. Concerned that UN Security Council sanctions on Iran are insufficiently impactful, and faced with the drawbacks of a U.S. military option, American opponents of Iran's nuclear weapons program are already creatively using law in at least three key ways to step up the pressure on Iran to comply with international law and cease its enrichment and other sensitive nuclear activities. I'll list them and then I'll go through them in a little bit of detail. Number one, the creative use of state level sanctions, including pension investment and contrast and sanctions. Number two, legal pressure on foreign banks doing business with Iran. And number three, legal pressure on foreign energy and insurance companies involved with supplying refined petroleum to Iran. How do these examples of lawfare work? What is their impact thus far on Iran and behavior? We'll start with number one, state level sanctions. <clears throat> Federal law, as some of you may know, prohibits all U.S. companies from trading with Iran directly, other than in food and medicine. Uh, however, while federal law prohibits all U.S. companies from doing that, and very few U.S. companies are still trading with Iran, many major foreign companies still do business with Iran in sectors such as energy and banking. As of a few years ago, U.S. state and local pension funds reportedly had some $188 billion invested in foreign companies doing business with state sponsors of terrorism, including Iran. This is leverage. Actual and even threatened state pension fund investment from such companies can contribute significantly to discouraging these and other foreign companies from investing in or otherwise doing business with Iran and other state sponsors of terrorism. That's the leverage. How has it been exercised? In an effort to discourage both Iran's state sponsorship of terrorism and Iran's illicit nuclear program, some 23 states and the District of Columbia have thus far invested pension funds from foreign companies with substantial investments in Iran's energy sector. I myself testified on behalf of those sanctions and four states in the District of Columbia. Um, there was initially some question, you know, for you lawyers out there, as to the consistency of these investments with Supreme Court supremacy clause cases. However, in 2010, President Obama signed into law the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Act, which clarifies that certain types of state and local investment from companies doing business with Iran are not preempted by federal law. So let's do the math. If 23 states have divested pension funds from companies investing in Iran's energy sector. How many are left? 27. <laughs> 
they were very math majors in the room. So, um, 27 states left. That's additional leverage that can still be exercised. In addition, six or so states have Iran sanctions laws or policies in place, which preclude public entities from renewing or entering into contracts with foreign companies with substantial investments in Iran's energy sector. One more chance for you uh, uh, math types. If only six states have such contract incentives in place, how many states are left? 44. 44 states have not yet adopted such Iran contract sanctions. Sanctions. The beauty of lawfare is that any sufficiently motivated lawyer can make a difference on these issues. I noticed recently that Doug Gansler, the Attorney General of Maryland, where I currently live, is president of the National Association of Attorneys General. So I reached out to Doug, and at my recommendation, with my help, he's in the process of launching an initiative to encourage and assist those other states to adopt pension investment in contracting sanctions. Now we'll turn to the second type of law, pressure on foreign banks to do business with their own. The U.S. Department of the Treasury has convinced more than 80 banks around the world, including most of the world's top financial institutions, to cease some or all of their business with their own. How has Treasury managed to this is a real success story for, for lawfare. There are two major innovations here. One is the use of the Treasury Department's financial authorities to pursue operational objectives. This is a significant change from, say, 20 years ago, when financial authorities were considered sacrosanct and to be kept separate from such objectives. In implementing this novel policy of using uh, its financial authorities, to achieve foreign policy objectives, Treasury's principal tactical innovation can be described as follows. In the past, the US government would say to the Swiss government, oh, Swiss government, please stop your banks from doing business with Iran. And the Swiss government would say, well, we're not sure we have the authority. Well, we'll look into it. Well, it's a multi-state process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Treasury has instead gone now directly to the Swiss banks and advise them of the risks of doing even prima facie legal business in Iran. Treasury has found that its unprecedented direct outreach to a country's key banks can yield results much more quickly than does outreach to the same country's government. And Treasury has also found that once one of a country's leading banks stop doing business with Iran, the others will soon follow. You don't want to be the Swiss bank that is still doing business with Iran. It's bad for your reputation. And even more importantly, once one Swiss bank, uh, or a bank in some other country, has stopped doing business with Iran, it has a lot of incentive to make sure the others get out. So it will share information with the US government about its competitors' continued dealings with Iran. Um, now, it's worth noting that the idea of pressuring foreign banks to stop doing business with Iran was dreamed up largely by one person, former Treasury official Stuart Levy. He saw Iran's vulnerability to a financial squeeze and dreamed up a way of leverage. With that, we come to our third and last uh, example of lawfare uh, against Iran. And that is pressure on foreign energy and insurance companies uh, doing energy-related business with in this area, the U.S. government is now replicating the go directly to the company approach uh, that, it, uh, that Stuart Levy initiated in the banking sector. Um, this innovation was uh, dreamed up in considerable part by me. Uh, I say that not to brag, but to inspire you that one person can make a difference. In 2008, I had just received tenure at ASU and was looking to take a break from scholarship and do something useful like help stop the Iran's nuclear program. How did I proceed? I started looking for other sectors, very interested in what Stuart Levy had managed to do. And I started looking for other sectors in which Iran was vulnerable and in which the go directly to the company approach that was working so well in the banking sector could be replicated. I noticed that although Iranian oil wells produce far more petroleum, crude oil, than Iran needs, Iran has relatively little capacity to refine that petroleum turn it into gasoline and diesel fuel 
right? You can't just take crude oil out of the ground and put it in your gas tank. You have to purify it, refine it. Uh, remarkably, for a country that is investing so much in its nuclear program, supposedly for the future of its energy sector, Iran has developed insufficient capacity to refine the petroleum it is already pumping out of its own soil. As a result, in 2008, Iran was importing some 40% of the gasoline it was consuming. I identified, did some research, identified the top five foreign companies supplying gasoline to Iran, and wrote in October 2008 a Wall Street Journal op-ed listing both the companies and how the U.S. could pressure them. Members of Congress read it, reached out to me, introduced legislation which I helped draft, I testified in favor of it four times, and the legislation passed. It was enacted. As a result of this lawfare, by October 2010, each of the companies that I had two years before named as one of the top five suppliers of gasoline to Iran had dropped out of supplying gasoline to Iran. And I'll give an example of how this works, right? Um, uh, I discovered that uh, one of the leading suppliers of gasoline to Iran was an Indian company named Reliance, which is actually the largest company in India. And it turned out that Reliance was refining the gasoline for Iran uh, at the very same refinery to which the U.S. government's Export-Import Bank had just provided uh, over a billion dollars in loan guarantees, right? So the U.S. government was actually subsidizing the expansion of this refinery at which Reliance was refining Iran's petroleum. And I wrote about this in my op-ed, and members of Congress were outraged, uh, they wrote a letter uh, to uh, the Export-Import Bank uh, asking why the Export-Import Bank had done this and supported this. Uh, the real answer was the Export-Import Bank hadn't noticed. Nobody put you know, two and two and so well, what's being refined at that refinery you're expanding? Nobody asked that question. But what happened was um, Congress wrote that letter to the Export-Import Bank. The letter went to public. And that very same day that the letter went public, Reliance's stock price in India dropped by $5 billion. Reliance decided to get out of the business of supplying gasoline to Iran. Um, <clears throat> as a result, the volume of gasoline imported by Iran is currently reportedly as much as 90% less than what Iran imported in months prior. Um, most recently, the US government, in partnership with the European Union, has targeted companies involved with Iran's lucrative crude oil exports. As a result, Iran's oil exports have been cut in half, and those who are still willing to purchase crude oil from Iran have been insisting on steep discounts. That will still buy from Iran, say the Chinese, for example. They're going to pay you a lot less than market price. Uh, a report today estimated that the crude oil sanctions alone are costing Iran about $3 billion per month. 30% of the Iranian government's total budget. Now, think about it. In the past, if you wanted to cut off the supply of gasoline to Iran, or Iran's crude oil exports, you would have had to either beg all of these foreign governments to do something about it, and say, wow, we don't have the authority, we think about it, we process these procedures, et cetera, et cetera, or you would have had to park destroyers right off the coast of Iran and boarded ships and risk war, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, by using lawfare, the U.S. and its allies have managed to shut down Iran's key banking relationships and to drastically reduce Iran's gasoline imports and oil exports without intercepting a single tanker. In all three cases, an implied or explicit threat of legal action pursuant to U.S. law delivered to the foreign company directly by U.S. officials has persuaded the foreign company to stop doing business with Iran, even though, in most cases, such business is not prohibited by the government of the country in which the foreign company is headquartered. As a result, Iran's pursuit of its illicit nuclear program has clearly been slow. They have a lot less revenue to pursue it. And the price to Iran of continuing it has increased significantly. The sanctions have not yet succeeded in coercing Iran into halting its illicit nuclear program. What's next? 
On the Iran front, it seems likely that the Obama administration and its allies will continue to try to ratchet up the economic pressure with the goal of forcing an economic crisis in Iran that is so severe that it puts the Iranian regime to a choice between regime preservation, presumably its top priority is staying in power, and its nuclear program, which is presumably a lesser priority. That seems to be the best hope for peacefully halting Iran's illicit nuclear program. And what is the future of this new concept named lawfare that I've referenced? I think it's quite correct. First, lawfare is less deadly to both combatants and bystanders than is traditional warfare. As one commentator put it, we have every reason to embrace lawfare, for it is vastly preferable to the bloody, expensive, and destructive forms of warfare that ravaged the world in the 20th century. Second, it seems to me that if some portion of international conflict can be shifted from the battlefield to the legal arena, that should be to the U.S.'s great advantage. Given the current predominant role in international law of U.S. legal experts, the exceptionally high percentage of America's best minds who entered the legal profession at places like Harvard Law School, and the vast amount of experience in creative lawyering, which is generated every year by our hyper litigious domestic legal system, the U.S.'s advantage in sophisticated legal methods has the potential to be even greater than its advantage in sophisticated lethal. The U.S. is the most heavily lawyered and litigious society on Earth, as we all know. Imagine if we were to turn some of that litigation talent and energy from inward facing to outward facing in the service of our national security. I think both the U.S. government and also concerned U.S. attorneys in the private sector would be doing far more to use law as part of our fight against Iran, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, and others who seek to engage in terrorist acts against the United States or acquire weapons of mass destruction. Unfortunately, the US government has not yet developed a systematic understanding of or doctrine addressing lawfare and its potential for advancing the operational objectives of the US and its allies. However, I'm trying to change that with a project I'd be happy to discuss during the Q&A. On that note, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we'll have a few days. First of all, thank you very much. It was a very sure. uh, rich and uh, high quality presentation. And I commend you for not just the paper, but all the work you've done over the years and, and your colleagues. So it's, it's very important. You and your colleagues are literally on the cutting edge of uh, profoundly important issues. So it's good to hear your words. But I'll, I'm going to take the priority of asking the first question and try to be a little bit challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so, in spite of the good work, do we have the time for both? And I would like to also challenge your notion of anti-Semitism, and the regime's anti-Semitism, as being irrational. I think it's actually very rational. It, um, it's consistent with a religious worldview, which non-practicing Muslims do not have the right to have self-determination in the region. And this is a, Israel's a problem for them uh, at a religious, philosophical, theological level. And they're using anti-Semitism and Israel as an enemy in a way to attract a lot of attention and a lot of support around the world. So I think it's actually not only rational, I think it's actually an effective weapon that they have in their arsenal against the West and, and, and certainly the Jews. The, the sanctions movement coming out of Washington has it as its principle, lawfare sanctions to isolate Iran. The regime just hosted more than 120 countries in the line movement. They're increasing trade with China, with Russia, and many other countries. And I would say from, from outside the Washington Beltway, and, and, and I'm not saying this facetiously, you know a lot more what's happening on the ground, but from the outside, and kind of dealing with this from an issue of anti-Semitism, I think it's been a complete colossal failure of the Obama notion of engaging Iran. And I think we're running out of time. Um, if you can respond to these kind of points, I'd, I'd be grateful. Is, is there a space for sanctions? Uh, what happened to Hariri? We were supposed to have the UN report that was supposed to be coming out again. There were proxies in Lebanon, and another horrible explosion happened. There's no reports, there's no UN. What's, 
Is this enough to stop this regime, which is on a messianic uh, agenda? Okay. Thanks for your questions. Um, I, I'll start with the, with the anti-Semitism point. Um, you were more of an expert on anti-Semitism than I am. Um, I'm an expert on international law and an expert on nuclear proliferation uh, law in particular. Um, but I was, I was struck. 